Thank you so much for tuning into the show and welcome to season two of the Audiobook Club with John York. The Audiobook Club, partnered with Pro Audio Voices, celebrates audiobooks, the amazing people and teams who make them happen, as well as the various talents behind storytelling. To learn more about Amplify and other opportunities to grow your sales, platform and audience, head over to ProAudioVoices.com and listen out for a short but informational advertisement within this episode. You can also click the link in the show notes. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club and welcome to our very first episode of 2023 and season two of the podcast. On today's show, we are so lucky to be joined by legendary voice actor, actor and audiobook narrator Mark Thompson. Mark, thank you so much for joining me on the show. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I didn't know I was first of 2023. <laughs> you are indeed, and the first of uh, season two as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to to kick us off, I, I would really love um, to know a little bit about your, your, your background and entry into voice acting. Um, could you perhaps tell us about when you first discovered a love for voice acting and, and performance and decided to pursue that as a career? I, I remember becoming aware of voice acting by watching uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. And there's that scene where Robin Williams is kind of like doing all the different voices for the cartoons and he's switching back and forth these seamlessly. And they're kind of showing what goes on behind the scenes. And I was like, Oh, right. Like that's, that's a job that people have, you know? <laughs> um, and that, and then, and then I, I can't remember if Aladdin was before that or after that, but like Robin Williams was a big uh, inspiration to me and kind of hero of mine. So, so he had a lot to do with it. And then I, my dad likes to remind me that when I was in grade school, I had a teacher that gave me like something like the motor mouth award or something like that, because okay. I would, I we were supposed to be sitting working quietly at our desks, but I was always making noises and kind of speaking under my breath. And, and as a joke, she gave me this award, but it, it kind of, you know, I guess it was like early on, I was always kind of mumbling and rambling and, and imitating things I would hear on TV. And, you know, so I, I kind of always was um, into that or drawn to that, I guess. Did you find that at a sort of a young age that you were able to sort of like imitate the voices that you heard on TV and then perform that to your to your friends and peers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a bit of a parrot and a, and a mimic, I guess, <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> um, and I had great like I had a really excellent acting program in my high school and uh Shout out to Miss Hofstetter, Miss Ham, Mr. Frost, and Jane. <laughs> but uh, like they, they really kind of nourished that. And my mom noticed really early on that I was drawn to the performing arts, and so she pretty early on got me involved in like improv classes and singing classes and acting mm -hmm. classes, and uh, was kind of you know making sure that I explored that further. So um, pretty yeah. early on, I had some people that maybe noticed an interest in it and then really watered it and kind of, you know, uh, supported it. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. So how did, how did audiobooks come about for you? Was that something that you were aware of before sort of getting into voice acting or was it, a, how did that come about? So I'm probably going to like, your listeners are probably going to hate me, but uh, <laughs> so I was, I was the kid in high school that, uh, hated reading. Like I was like, uh, like I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't like reading and, it, the the idea of reading an entire book was just overwhelming. So I would like, if you had to do a book report, I'd try to find the movie version and like watch the movie or, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like or get the clip notes thing. So um, my, I, I started my career mainly doing animation and kind of doing character voices on cartoons and things like that. And at, at one point I got an agent and then a couple of years in my agent reached out and said, you know, have you ever done an audio book? And, you know, as soon as I heard the word book, I'm like, eh, you know, like, <laughs> like I have to read a whole book. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm done with school. I don't want to do that. So I was kind of trying to kind of talk her out of it in a way. I was like, no, not really. And I'm not really sure it's my thing. And, you know, and she was like, well, we've got an audition for a Star Wars audiobook. And I was like, whoa, whoa hold on. Yes, yes. Wait, hold on. You know, and like, I was like, so excited because it was Star Wars. So yeah. I, you know, I, I literally had not read a book. I think, you know, like, since school like I, I might have finished a book in college but I probably even then was skimming and stuff so uh but uh and listening to like lectures and you know notes and stuff but uh yeah. so so it was a bit of a learning curve 
really learning how to, because I think I got cast in the audiobooks because I could do the character voices and I mm. and I could kind of, you know, do that kind of parroting, mimicking animation thing I've gotten accustomed to. But then uh, Kevin Thompson, who directs most of the books that I work on, uh, basically kind of held my hand and like helped me to understand the importance of storytelling and like the importance of, because you know, he, he went, there was just one session where he said to me, you know, the dialogue is interesting, but everything else you're saying is boring. And like, you're, you're mm -hmm. not, you're not telling the story. Like you're not painting the picture and you gotta, you gotta make the prose as engaging as you are the dialogue. And that, that kind of like, yeah, helped me unlock it. And, and, and his direction has kind of really helped me. And now it's really odd because, you know, uh, narrating audiobooks has, you know, kind of become one of my favorite things. Like I, you know, mainly mm. the Star Wars audiobooks still, because I, I just have a special connection to Star Wars, but like, mm. I, I kind of appreciate the art of storytelling and and the challenge of performing the, the book as opposed to just your character. And, and so I, I've really come to love it. And I've come to understand, oh, this is why people like books, you know, because like you can like <laughs> really get into the character's mindset and you get to know what they're thinking much more so than a two hour film or a one hour yeah. TV show. It's like you're really understanding things about the world and the character that you would never have time to explore in any other medium. So I'm yeah. like, oh, this is why people really like this, you know? <laughs> so yeah. That's so interesting that you mentioned um, about the you know the narrating the prose aspects of the book because obviously we know you now as as one who who brings so much energy and so much life into that section as well as obviously the the characters and the dialogue and things so it's really interesting that that was a that was a process would you say that you know that, that you learned through there? No, yeah. yeah, thank you for saying that. And I, I think uh, I think in a weird way when Kevin was helping me with that it gave me permission to explore that more. Um, like, mm. you know, and, and I, and I think, uh, and he, he also uh, helped me to see that, like, you know, the, the idea of point of view and like, you know, mm. like, like this, this chapter is kind of, I really want you to get into Luke's point of view when you're, you know, describing mm. the colors of the walls in this room or, you know, like there's a reason he's noticing these things or there's a reason yeah. that, you know, you know, Han or or the Emperor is describing the setting in this way because it means something to that character. And so I think once mm. I could kind of get those emotional ends, mm. the, the prose started making more sense to me because before I was just like, <sighs> you know, like you're boring, you know, <laughs> like get to the dialogue, get to the dialogue. And now I yeah. understand that, you know, no, that's all part of the character. Like everything, everything is part of these, you know, of, of building that world and stuff. So it's, it's really yeah. cool. So with Star Wars, uh, you know, being a, a, a huge part of your life uh, as a fan and a, and a consumer, when being asked to to join the world, you know, as a professional, um, were there any sort of nerves or, you know, were, were, did that ever like cross your mind, like entering this this huge world where obviously there's millions of fans around the world going to be listening to listening to your work? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and still does <laughs> like uh, <Yeah. laughs> like. I think at first, um, I'm trying to remember when. I, th I think the first one I did was somewhere around 2006 or something like that. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think I understood that there was a, a, a an established fan base for the audiobooks. Like obviously, mm. I knew there was one for Star Wars, but I didn't know too many people in my life that listened to audiobooks. And I, I I almost thought it was exclusively for people that maybe, you know, weren't able to read or, you mm. know, like like a, almost like a learning thing or yeah. something. You know? yeah. So um, I didn't really know too much about audiobooks and in terms of fans of them and all that stuff. So I, in the beginning, I wasn't nervous for the exposure per se, um, but I was just nervous because it was star Wars and I wanted to get it right. And I wanted to do justice to this thing that I loved, you know? Yeah. And then like slowly, but surely, you know, I, it's always dangerous to do this, but I started reading some of the reviews, you know, and I was like, Oh, people are yeah. kind of liking it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so like, so I, I always have to be careful because I, by nature am a people pleaser. So I, I, yeah. I don't, I, I don't, I don't read them super often because I don't want to start, hearing different opinions in my head and, and feeling, you know, um, creatively hampered or, or judged or, you know, so like sometimes I have to, 
sometimes I, I, I do it and sometimes I, I avoid it because I don't want it to affect me too much. But, um, yeah. but once I started seeing, oh, people like it, then it was a different pressure of now I got to keep them liking it. And what if I mess up and what if they don't yeah. have to start not liking it? And, you know, so that, so that plays with my head all the time. And there's a lot of insecurities I have about that, but yeah. the main, the main stress and nerves is always just that this is Star Wars. Wars. And like, for me, mm. it was like, you know, <laughs> it was, it was pretty close to like a religion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. It was like, so I, I really don't ever, I really want to do it justice. And I, re I, I really, I know how important it is to me and I want, I want the quality of it, uh, to, to be maintained. Cause I just know how important it is to people. So I was going to ask about how you are, um, with reviews. Cause you know, there's so many different ways of, uh, of looking at it, both positive and negative reviews. Um, you know, as as a performer and, and adapting that, uh, so you you would say that generally, generally, mostly you kind of stick away, you kind of do your own thing, you you, you sort of trust your trust your instinct and your director and your team, etc. Uh, for the most part, like I I think you know sometimes my you know worldly you know wanting to get validation side of me will 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 yeah get me going, and then some and sometimes now I'll like initially maybe just when a book first gets released. I will want to know, is it being well received or not? So I'll, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll glance, but like, I I have to kind of, I think, I think so if I'm being truly honest, I look mm -hmm. at them, but then I have to stop myself and I try to like, I don't, it's not like a, it, it could very easily become like a daily thing for me if I'm not careful. <laughs> so yeah. I, I do it more for just to get a sense of am I still doing my job? And like, you know, and if, if there, if every once in a while, if there's something that maybe I can take as constructive criticism, I'll try to try to look at it that way. Mm. But the problem is, and this is the problem as a people pleaser is that, you know, I'll find some comments that say, I love that he used this type of voice on this character and it just fits it so well. And then I'll read another reviewer who says, why did he pick that voice for that character? Like <laughs> awful was so distracting, yeah. you know? So like, yeah. So it's like you, you can drive yourself crazy because you can't please everybody all the time. And, and, and what one person loves another person hates. And then you, so you'll just, that that's where it can, it can be yeah. paralyzing because it's like, well, if I'm doing it for those different opinions, they'll be in contradiction all the time. So at a yeah. certain point I have to kind of trust what my instincts are, what Kevin's instincts are, and just trust that, you know, if, if, if enough people like it, I'll still get to keep yeah. doing them, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, like, it's just, and, and then, and then there's a bit of like, just learning to accept that a lot of this really is subjective and it's okay mm -hmm. if people don't like what you do. And, and, you know, cause there's, you know, and I, I think all of, as Star Wars has expanded, you know, there's certain things that, you know, there's some people that love, you know, Mandalorian. And then there's other people that feel like Andor is the best thing ever made. And then there's some people that think the Clone Wars cartoon is the best thing ever, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and some of them disagree with each other, and, but that's okay. Like that's just, you yeah. know, just different things for different, different, yeah. stroke, you know, the familiar voices that we all know and love so well is, of course, such a a, a large part of 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 many uh, Star Wars audiobooks. So, when having to incorporate well known voices from such a, a wide spectrum of the of the Star Wars universe, you you mentioned that you you got cast because you your ability to to do those voices. Now, I just wondered, is there a particular character's voice that you remember being a little bit more challenging to to get down? That's a great question. My gut is to say Leia, but it's not like because it's not, it's, it's just more like, because I wanted to do it justice and I, I didn't yeah. want to do the, the you know, I'm a woman, so I'm speaking in a high voice, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like, <laughs> so like uh, I, think, I think just trying to distinguish her from Luke and, you know, but mm. there's certain cadences and line readings that Carrie Fisher had that I would try to kind of latch on to. Mm. Um, but I think of the familiar voices, um, those were a little bit easier for me to latch on to just because I had watched the films so many times mm. that uh, even if I couldn't perfectly get the tone or perfectly get the accent, that there's certain like line readings or cadences that I could latch onto that would kind of get me in a certain rhythm to yeah. get me kind of close enough, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and so, and it was almost a bit of a security blanket when it was an established character. Cause I could just listen to, you know, Tarkin over and over and over again to try, you, you may fire when ready, you know, or something, you know, or just like, you know, That's pretty just good. try to get like a, a line where, 
you know, like I, so I would, I would oftentimes, if I was doing something in the era of Jedi or empire or whatever, like I would just watch those films as I was reading the book or, or kind of, I record samples on my phone and just as I'm walking mm. the dog, listen to certain lines over and over again. And so that, that was almost a security blanket for me to have something to go to as an anchor or, you know, something to help me out. But the characters that I had to create from scratch, those were a little more challenging because I felt like I didn't have as much to grab onto or, you know, so like, uh, yeah. So, so the ones that are established, there's always the pressure of comparison and that, you know, someone's yeah. gonna be like, that doesn't sound like Harrison Ford or, you know, but like, yeah. but then there's like the other part of like, I can, I have something I can use as a foundation and then build from there. So. So for the, for the characters that, that haven't perhaps seen light previously on, on other mediums, you know, in the, in the films or TV shows or, you know, many of the others, I'd love to know about your process for creating those voices, um, you know, and, and all of your ac- fantastic accent work as well. You, 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 what, what is your process for, for creating voices for characters that we, we haven't seen before? Most of it is like in, in acting school, they talked about text analysis and like mm. I had a teacher uh, that would like talk about looking at what all the other characters say about your character or looking at how the author describes the character. And and so a lot of it is, you know, 80 to 90% of it is done by the author. And they're, they're mm. kind of giving me all these clues, you know, about how they're described or, you know, and, you know, if, if another character sees this character is, is blustery or stern or, you know, abrasive, those, those are all clues that I take and say, well, what would that sound as a voice? Like, you know, what, what qualities vocally could I do? to allude to that abrasiveness or that, you know, yeah. so like maybe put some gravel in there or whatever, you know, and, um, or, you know, if, if it is, uh, in the star Wars book specifically, if it's a certain, you know, from the, if it's a character from a certain planet or an alien species, and I've seen that species on a film or cartoon before, uh, I might use that as like a rough skeleton of like, you know, like anytime there's a Mon Calamari, you know, I, I I'm, putting in that gravel that akbar you know and, and just yeah. and I, I do this thing with my face where it helps me if i stretch my mouth out the way that that mask looks to me because then i imagine that that's what you know that would affect yeah. how that person might talk or you know so so there's things like that and then um i'll i'll anytime anyone speaks in the book i make a note of it and i i try to copy and paste any lines of dialogue that i feel like are really exemplary of who they are mm. again any descriptions of them and then after I've written down every character and any notes I have about them, then I go back and I like cast it. So like, I'll try to think, well, what would it be a good voice for this character? And then I'll record samples on my phone. And then, you know, once I have something I like, and then when I get in the booth, I'll like listen to that sample, maybe right before I go in mm. uh, to that scene and and just refresh my memory of what I was thinking. And then, and then I can kind of use that as my way to kind of get in and out. And usually it's like, the first couple of days, there's a lot of start and stop. And what was I thinking again? But yeah. then around day three, I, I've, I've kind of gotten to know the characters well enough that I can start just ping ponging and kind of, you know, going straight through without having to stop every, you know, two minutes and listen. So I find it, I find it so fascinating. You mentioned like the, 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 what you would do with your face. So would you say that you, you're quite a physical performer then when, when changing around these characters? Does that help, you know, get yourself into that space? It, it it helps me, but it but it it, it frustrates the engineer because I'm always like, you know, hitting the mic and stuff and like you know like yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. and I'm like sometimes I'm backing up or like shouting or you know and so they're like like you got to just keep it down or you know so yeah so but but I I I do think that helps a lot so like I have to be careful what I wear in the booth sometimes so I'm not accidentally hitting my shirt yeah. or anything you know but but yeah I definitely I definitely think that helps is is your physicality yeah um, yeah. I narrate audiobooks uh, myself. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's 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 been yeah a bit of a dream come true really to do this full time. But one of the things that I can't help um, but think when I listen to uh, you know Star Wars audiobooks, much narrated by yourself, is that the pronunciation guides that you must be sent must be just enormous. <laughs> like- yeah, <laughs> there's a guy. Um, what's uh. Oh no, Le- uh, I think Leland Chi is still who does it, but they they call him the keeper of the holocron, and uh, <laughs> nice. it's like him and Pablo, I believe, and they they have like a giant database of like every time these words appear in 
TV shows or books or whatever. And yeah, and uh, they every, every for every book we get another spreadsheet of all the new alien species and stuff. And you know, yeah. And so you know, but it's the thing is, is like when you're dealing with a franchise that's forty what five years old and yeah. been in all these things, inevitably. Um, there's going to be variances and, and different pronunciations. And, mm. you know, so I, I was, I was super particular about it for a long time. And then now I've had to kind of just surrender that, you know, you know, I, I think Charles soul said like, you know, it's the Leia and Leah or, you know, the yeah, yeah. You know, potato thing, you know, like, it's like, just like on our world, not everyone pronounces everything the same way. It's the same thing in the galaxy far, far away. So like that, that yeah. kind of, you know, but but you do have to like you know uh, recently on um, Convergence, which was the latest High Republic book, um, we had to go back and re-record all the times that oh, and I'm going to say it wrong now, <laughs> but like <laughs> there's two there's two planets that's uh, it's I think it's Iram and Arano, and and I one I think I think we were saying Arona before, and then it had to be Arano and like. And like, you know, this was the main thing of the whole book is these two planets. So like we had to go back and it was like two hours worth of like pronouncing the planet the new way. And, and I was like, ah, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's it can be daunting. <laughs> All part of the fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as as well as countless audiobook titles within the uh, the Star Wars universe, you've also uh, appeared in uh, in plenty of audio dramas within the universe as well, such as uh, The Battle of Jeddah and The Tempest Runner. Um, I'd love to know how the process of working on an audio drama differs uh, to narrating on um, an audiobook solo. Are there any differences there for, for you? Oh, yeah, most certainly. Like, I think um, with the audio dramas, uh, it's much more like a play for me um mm. when we did um when we did uh dooku jedi lost um that one was especially fun because we recorded it in a big studio and like five or six of us were in a room uh together mm. and we were we were like playing scenes off of each other the way you would in theater so that was really fun and i felt like that really enhanced the performances and like you know you you could like you know you're you're being influenced in the moment by what the mm -hmm. actor's doing and and their their take on the character and so i really really enjoyed that um dr afra and then tempest runner um were kind of during the shutdowns um mm -hmm. so we were doing those from our home and so there were i got to do a couple scenes i think with Emily for Dr. Afra, like, but it was remote. So like, you know, we, mm. so that was still, that was still different than normal. Cause normal you're, you're just doing all the conversations by yourself. And like, so it's, it's just so vitalizing and energizing to like have another actor to play off of. So I, so I, I just really, really enjoyed that. Uh, yeah. uh you know, so, so I think, I think th that's the main difference. And then, and then um, I think you can focus much more on your character and your character's intentions when you're, when you're just focused on these particular scenes. And I think like yeah. in the recording of them, um, we get to spend more time in the scenes and spend mm -hmm. more time, you know, really trying to get it right. Whereas when you're doing a 16 hour, you know, audio book, there's, there's a little bit more pressure to kind of muscle yeah. through it and not be so precious about every single scene and moment because you know, you, you got to every, every hour you're in the studio, you're paying for the studio. And, you know, so it's like, yeah, you, you only have so much time and you could, you could, you could get too particular about it. And it, it can kind of, you know, it's the paralysis of analysis and you, you know, there's always a better take and you, you would just yeah. never finish it, you know? So, yeah. Um, but when you have the other actors there, I think, I think we do tend to like slow down and, and spend a little more time. And, and, and sometimes ideas happen in the booth with the other actors and you're like, Oh yeah, that was great. We should do it that way. You know? So yeah, I'm rambling now, but yeah, it's, no. it's I, I love the audio dramas. I think they're really fun to do. Yeah, I bet they do. They certainly sound like it. And then just the ability to go like deeper into the, into the characters you say, and then spend more time. Um, how does working with the director on an audiobook differ from working with the director in, let's say, on you know for an animation or for you know uh, for some of your uh, some other like voice acting medium? I would say like what's specific to audiobooks is like because you're 
not just doing the character, but you're telling the whole story. Like Kevin has this really great illustration he'll sometimes use about a, like a symphony or an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And he'll talk about how all the instruments, even though they're distinct and different, they have to work together to make the song. And like, so like there's certain things that if I were just an actor, just doing my scene, you know, I might, you know, do something that's like really, you know, specific to how I, th I think the character would do it, but it might not serve the story. And I think as a, as an, as, as you know, like the, there's definitely times where Kevin will like kind of help me realize we need to be more reserved in this moment because we're, we're building to the crescendo. Mm -hmm. And if, if everything's the crescendo, it, it, it just, it's, it, it doesn't work. You you need the kind of peaks and valleys. And so we, we got to bring it down. So we have somewhere to build to, and like, you know, or, or he'll, you know, remind me that we've got to foreshadow this beat a little bit harder because it's, it's going to pay off you know, four hours from now. So you, we've got to, we've got to make sure that, you know, in, in this moment, it might seem like a throwaway thing, but that comes back later. So we got to, we got to make a, we got to underline that a little bit, you know? And, hmm. and so he's really good at keeping that big picture. Cause especially, you know, with the length of these things, it's a little bit easier for me at least to get lost in what's important or what, 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 what is going to, you know, mean something yeah. to the story or, or where are we going? And, you know, so like he's, He's, he he ha he kind of helps me look at the big picture because I can as a I, I guess I'm more as a performer more kind of connected to the immediacy of what's happening in this paragraph or in this particular scene and he's mm -hmm. really good at helping me like outline you know the significance of this scene in the grander scheme of things you know and, mm. yeah it's which I suppose directors for film and TV probably do the same thing but like <laughs> but it definitely. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not thinking about all that when I'm just doing one character on a cartoon or one character in a show. Like, so, yeah, a favorite show of mine um, still to this day is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series that ran um, that you just so happened to be <laughs> play Casey Jones. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about how that role came about or maybe just, you know, your overall experience of, of being a part of that show? Oh, yeah. Um, that was super fun for me because that was the. First time that I, because I've been very fortunate because I've gotten to work on several projects now that are reminiscent or like they're kind of reboots of things that I was a fan of. So like I've yeah. gotten to do Star Wars. I've gotten to do some stuff in the Marvel Universe. I've gotten to do um, G.I. Joe and Transformers. Yeah. But like so Ninja Turtles was like the first one of those kind of properties that I grew up on. And then I'm getting to do a new version of. And I was like, no. So like, <laughs> um, I think I was doing, I was working on like, um, Yu-Gi-Oh and the, there was this company Four kids entertainment that was doing that. And they got the rights to do a new version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And their whole angle was, is that the eighties cartoon was super fun and, and super, you know, funny and things like that. But for this version, they wanted it to be a little bit closer to what the graphic novels were and have it a little bit more action adventure tone, still lots of humor, but like, you know, maybe a little edgier and darker. Um, so I was really into that. So uh, called in and I auditioned for all the turtles and and for Casey and I was really hoping to get Mikey. <laughs> uh, but my friend Wayne got Mikey and he did an amazing job with that. But, uh, um, but yeah, I, 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 I got to do Casey and I was walking down 23rd street and I got a phone call and they said, you know, Hey, we'd really like you to be Casey. And I just kind of stopped in the street and I was like, no way, you know, like it's just freaking yeah. out and, you know, and then, you know, that was another unique experience because most of the shows I had done up until that point were, uh, dubs, like meaning they were dubbing, uh, cartoons that were originally produced in Japan mm -hmm. into English. So like the other cartoons I had done up until, well, except for Daria, Daria was a prelay show and that was my first ever big break. Um, but the, I'd been doing dubs for a while at that point and then Ninja Turtles was going to be a prelay show again. And so that one was unique because we got like, again, like four of us in a room together, which is very unusual. Usually you don't do that, but like, it was like the turtles and me or, a couple of the turtles in April and like we would, mm -hmm. we would do, we get to again, play off of each other and be in the scenes. And it was really great. And, you know, I don't, I don't think, I didn't know as much about Casey 
And I just remember like one of my first scenes where I had to go, you know, I was like, come on, Raph, let's bash the purple dragons. Goon. And I was like, Goon Gala, Goon Gala. And I was like, what is this? And everybody just like, like kind of laughed at my folly or whatever. And then yeah. I had to explain, it's like, it's Goongala. I was like, okay, Goongala. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but uh, so it was, it was super fun. And I, I, I loved getting to do him. He was, he was really a cool character. That's such a cool show. Such a cool show. Such a cool character. Um, have you um a bit of a bit of a <laughs> bit of a big question just throw at you? I do apologize, but have you um have you any advice for up and coming narrators, voice actors, um on how they can make the best impression if given such an opportunity of working with the studios, uh, working with uh, you know the production companies that you have done. Um, how how do they increase their chance of of getting asked back? It's a good question. Like I think um, the blessing and the curse of a lot of industries nowadays is we we have more access than ever because of the internet. So mm. it's 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 like you can get a chance to read for a lot more things than you would have normally. But then the curse is is that there's so much competition and there's you're, you're competing with everyone with a microphone and a laptop now, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think if you can try to find what is unique to you and kind of, you know, like you want to be, you want to improve all of your skill sets. You know, you want to, you want to, you want to try to strengthen all of the skills needed to narrate audiobooks. So like really, you know, if you're like, Fresh, fresh starting out, it, it would be things like, you know, practice reading out loud because mm. you read and you read quietly much faster and, and quicker. But like when you have to read something out loud, where you take pauses and where you take breaths uh, is not immediately obvious. And some you have to kind of get used to that. Mm. Um, I had a friend who's a great narrator, gave me some advice one time to just slow down like a half a beat mm. because Sometimes I would I would try to read things super fast, but then my mind would start going faster than my mouth could go and I'd start tripping up and making a lot of mistakes. And he was like, if you just slow down just just a little bit, just a hair, uh, it gives your mouth time to like, you know, like your 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 eye is reading the next three sentences, but your mouth is still on that first one. So like if you yeah. can like slow down just a hair, that that helps. So I don't know, like I but I think if you can find out like what what makes you you or what makes you different and don't don't try to emulate other narrators as much as you are trying to find out like what's your unique thing that you're bringing to the table um because if you're trying to emulate what other narrators do you you know chances are that other narrator is going to be the one that's going to get that job you know but if, yeah. but there's something that each of us has that's unique to us your life experience or the tone of your voice or your your unique perspective, like the way you read that line is going to be different than the way someone else reads that line. And so, you know, I think if you can just find ways to tap into that, it will start to make you stand out from all of those hundreds, if not thousands of people all trying out for that same thing, you know. And, yeah. But, you know, like there's there's tons of like, um, you know, January Lavoy always says, if you want to be an audiobook narrator, like just sit down and try to read something out loud for 10 minutes and just time yourself doing that. And if you after if after 10 minutes, you you can read that out loud and you're and you're not frustrated and angry or you know, <laughs> then like, you know, <laughs> you might want to give it a try. But it is it is something that you have to that there's a discipline to it. That's uh, that takes some getting used to. And it's it's like any other muscle you have to like really exercise it and the more you exercise it the better you'll get at it yeah um, but it's it's definitely uh it's it's like you know i always feel stupid saying this because there's so many more difficult things in the world to do for a living but like audiobooks and i'm sure you probably can attest to this but like audiobooks are the most challenging voiceover thing there is to do you know because like cartoons you you can you know i'll have sessions that sometimes are a half hour for 45 minutes and then you're done or, you know, or, yeah. or ADR or film or television, you know, but like, like books, it's like, you're in there for like, you know, a week sometimes, you know, yeah. just yeah, yeah. wake up in the morning, late at night. And it's just, it just, you get fatigued and you, you mental stuff oh, yeah. starts to happen. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's a very, you know, and obviously it's not hard physical labor, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a challenging thing to do, to take on. So a hundred percent. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. I I know exactly what, we, what you mean. Um, I do have one final uh, Star Wars question before we uh, wrap up, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so back uh, back in August, we had the release of uh, the Princess and the Scoundrel by uh, Beth Revis, uh, co-narrated by Saskia Marleveld. Uh, oh, I've just tripped up over her name. I think it's so, Marleveld, yeah. Marleveld, yes. I do apologize, Saskia. I'd really love to hear about the process of, of dual narration um, on, on a title such as this. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about your experience uh, on this title and working with the phenomenal Saskia? Yeah, um, that it was It was a really cool opportunity. And I, and I think it was it, it was very smart of Beth um, because a lot of that came from the book because like each those who've listened to it or read it will know that like basically the the clever device of the book is that the chapters alternate between Han's perspective and Leia's perspective. Mm. So you'll get one chapter that is kind of like Han's point of view and maybe Han will go off and do something. And then the next chapter you're seeing, well, what was Leia during while doing while Han was doing this? And then sometimes they come together. And then if they're together, you see the the adventure from Han's point of view. And then we switch gears and see it from Leia's point of view. So it Kevin had the idea of like, we really should, in the same way that the chapters are alternating, we should alternate the narrators as well. So it was it was really cool. And, and uh, yeah. I, I really liked it a lot. I think I, I wish that I got a chance to... Like, like Kevin had this ideas for the very last chapter that we would actually do those two together. Um, spoiler yeah. alert. Sorry. But um, <laughs> that's like, <laughs> but that was the only time I got to do like perform with her. And it, yeah. there's definitely like me, a part of part of me that would have loved to have like, you know, done all the whole book where we're all like alternating yeah. lines of dialogue and playing off of each other in dialogue. Yeah. Um, but it probably would have been a nightmare for the editors and, and very time consuming, but, uh, <laughs> but she's, she's incredibly talented. And so it was, it was an honor to get to be on the book with her, but I didn't get to work with her yeah. the way I might've like during, like the, I, I've worked with her in the audio dramas and, and, and that was super fun and, you know, but, mm. but I was, I was, I was hoping it would be more like that, but it, but, I, but I like this, I think the finished product of this is very unique and special. Yeah, uh, in in that sense, so fantastic. Well, just as we as we come to a close, I just want to to finish off by asking: Are there any upcoming projects that you're excited about? Uh, you know, coming up in the in the schedule that we could perhaps look forward to. Yeah. Um. Well, I think you mentioned it earlier, but Battle of Jeddah just released, and that's an audio yeah. drama, and I, yeah. I'm a couple characters on that, so that was super fun to do. Um, and then I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to say this. So, but I think the next High Republic book, I believe it's called Cataclysm, okay. uh, and I'm I'm going to be uh, narrating that one. So we're we're uh, I'm kind of in the preparation phase of that right now, um, and that that'll be coming up uh, later this year. So I'm pretty excited about that. Oh, fantastic. Well, that just about does it for this episode of the Audiobook Club. All of the reference projects will be linked in the show notes, as well as Mark's social media and website, etc. Thank you so much for listening. And a huge thank you to you, Mark. Of course, it has been an utter delight to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much. I had so much fun. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com. You'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.